Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 26th of June, 2022, and a decent amount of updates this week. As always, if you find this useful, a like and subscribe is appreciated. I have the chapters along the bottom of the video, so you can jump to a particular area of updates that may be of more interest. And new videos this week, I really focused all around Azure Policy. So I did an anatomy of Azure policy video, really diving into, well, what does an Azure policy do? How do we define them? I went through some examples of the various pieces of functionality. Policy is so useful when I think about the governance and control of my resources in Azure, and then with things like Azure Arc, actually extending its reach beyond. And then I did a follow-on video talking about policy exemptions and the permissions I need to actually use them. On the update side, so on the compute, Java and Node.js now have durable function support. So the whole point about durable functions is I have these longer running stateful functions. Obviously functions are serverless, so normally they spring into existence based on some event happening and they go away. Well, for certain patterns, it could be function chaining, a fan out and then fan back in again, some sort of asynchronous HTTP API, if it's monitoring, watching something else, or just need some human interaction, well, I need the concept of a stateful function. And now I can also write them with Java and Node.js. Azure Functions now also have Python 3.10 in preview. An app service now has a hybrid connection manager for Linux. So often from the application that I'm running in my app service plan, I may want to be able to go and access some resource. Maybe it's on premises. And one of the ways I can do that is using this hybrid connection manager. Now this hybrid connection manager is a, an endpoint. Think of it as a relay agent and it has to run on an OS, for example, on premises. And then it establishes the connection to the app service, which can then use that relay to get to things maybe on my on-premises network. Before that, I had to run on Windows. Now, I can actually get that hybrid connection manager for Linux. So if I'm a Linux developer, if I'm working in that environment, I can still get that relay agent and enable connectivity to those resources. App Service now has .NET 7 support in preview, so I can start writing my web applications using the new version of .NET. AKS has a number of updates. So this HTTP proxy support. There may be times where I need to use a proxy, and previously there was no way to bootstrap that proxy configuration when I created my AKS cluster. So that would cause problems actually trying to create if it couldn't get to the right endpoints. Well now I can actually bootstrap using this functionality. So it's adding this HTTP proxy support for my AKS cluster, which now makes it easier to secure the AKS traffic using the proxy I configure. I can do that with a command, I can do that through my template. So now that's a native capability. AKS 1.24 has support now, so the newer version updates available in Kubernetes, so that's now in preview. A custom Certificate Authority, a CA, is in preview. This is a per node pool configuration. I can now, through that ability to add my own custom CAs, I could now trust my own private resources. So it could be a private repository, a private firewall, a private proxy, using that ability to add a custom CA. It's working behind the scenes as a Kerberos secret, and then it passes that to all the nodes in the node pool I configure it on. So if I do need those private types of resources, I can now enable that through the custom CA. There's now a release tracker. So if we think about for AKS, they're constantly releasing new versions of that base image that runs on all of the nodes. That has things like latest OS security patches, kernel updates, Kubernetes security updates, updates of various binaries, and then I go and update the node pool images via things like AZ, AKS node pool upgrade. I can use GitHub Actions. Well, now I can actually track and see, well, where are the various versions for the AKS? So it's showing us all the different regions which version is currently available in the last versions. But I can also see the release order. So here I can actually go and see, well, how are these versions rolling out? 
So when I can see, hey, in the Canary regions, Canary 1 and Canary 2, hey, uh, the 0619 is there. It's also there for West Central US. UK South, hey, well, that's on 12. Um, East US 2 and all these other regions, so I can see 19. So that gives me that ability to get the detail of which version is in which regions, and I can even click on these to then go to the release page that shows me exactly what are the release notes, what's changed in this. So for example, here I can see, hey, the new AKS Ubuntu 1804 image has been updated to this uh, .6.13, so new updates, for example, to the OS and the Kubernetes components, etc. So that's a nice way that I can actually now go and track uh, those various things that I might want to be able to see what's happening. Um, Azure Static Web Apps have new API backends available to me. So the whole point of Azure, Azure Static Web Apps is pre-rendered content. It's distributed around various regions, so it's easily available. But there might be times I need some server-side processing. So Azure Static Web Apps also have this fantastic integration with Azure Functions, so seamlessly it can just go and call a function to do, hey, when I need some server-side processing. What they're adding here is also new API backends. Um, Azure App Service, Azure Container Apps, and Azure API Management can all be automatically routed now as the backends from my Azure Static Web Apps. And VMSS Spot Recommendations is in preview. So this is all about the experience. Hey, I want to go and create a new virtual machine scale set. And one of the nice things we have is Azure regions have spare capacity. Well, that spare capacity, rather than being completely idle, they make it available as spot for a greatly reduced price. So that's all well and good. And then obviously I can tell it, well, how much am I willing to pay before I get kind of evicted for a pay-as-you-go workload? So I can say, hey, I want to run with Azure Spot Discount. And if I click Configure, one of the nice things I now get is I can do the usual, hey, is it capacity or price and capacity, i.e. the amount I'm willing to pay. But I can also now do a size recommendation. I can go and select potential regions I want it to go and look at. And then from that, it's actually recommending a particular SKU and a particular region. So out of the regions that I've selected and the possible ones that might meet my workload, it's looking at the history of eviction rates and the pricing, and it will now actually recommend me a SKU that gets me the lowest cost. So it really just helps me make the, the best decision I can when I'm thinking about, hey, yes, I'm trying to run this spot workload. Remember, we use spot when it's resumable. I'm willing to be evicted if need be for the benefit of getting that greatly reduced cost. Well, now it's actually helping me make an even better choice to see, hey, look, where's the lowest price one I can use, the exact SKU, the exact region, uh, based on those that I select. On the storage side, so for Azure NetApp Files, remember that's the Azure first-party offering using NetApp Filers, now has SMB continuous availability shares when I'm using Citrix app layering. So basically now for those Citrix app layering virtual disk, it's going to eliminate app downtime because of maybe some kind of storage event. So it's leveraging that SMB continuous availability now that's available on Azure NetApp files. Um, Azure SQL Database Hyperscale named replicas as gone GA. So remember, Hyperscale is where we separate out the compute and the page servers to really give us massive capacity and performance. Well, I can have read replicas. So I have my read write primary and then multiple read replicas. I can actually have up to 30 of these rep read replicas, and they can now be named read replicas, which enables me to, they're using the same page servers behind the scenes, so the same storage, but from a compute perspective, I can have different instances, different named read replicas. They can be different sizes, and then I can direct my application workload that, hey, if I just want to do maybe some analytics, I can target a particular named read replica that this app is going to talk to, and a different named read replica for this other app. And my main application, hey, it talks to the primary read-write replica. So now I have those capabilities. It helps me control 
the resource utilization and the impact on my database of particular applications. Azure SQL Database server roles are in preview. So ordinarily, we grant roles at the, the database level. Because remember, the server in Azure SQL Database is very much a logical concept. Well, they've actually added the concept of some server roles. So these all start with the format of this kind of hash hash uppercase ms underscore, and then end with kind of the, the hash hash. But these will get inherited down to the databases underneath the server where I grant this. So if actually these are all the different built-in server roles, this is in preview, but these are the ones. And so if I grant these, then it will get inherited down to the databases under that particular server where I set them. So it's just a simpler way of now allocating and setting those permissions where I have that scenario where, hey, I want this particular role to go to all the database under this server. Hey, I can now do that with those server roles. Also on database Cosmos DB, the, the free experience, no credit card, 30 day free trial sandbox. There's a new SQL API query engine. This is really a set of improved performance over a number of types of queries. If I'm doing group by, distincts, offset limits, um, various operations over joins, it's using new types of indexes in more scenarios, really just improves the overall performance for the SQL API. Also, the SQL API Go SDK has a number of improvements. Primarily, it can now authenticate with Azure AD. So I now get that fine-grained role-based access control we get with Azure AD. Instead of having to use primary keys, I can scope queries to a particular partition. We get transactional batches, so multiple operations that all succeed or all fail as a unit. Continuous backup has some enhancements. This is the free seven day or the paid 30 day. Continuous restore capabilities now with the SQL API, MongoDB API, Gremlin API, and the table APIs, so improvements there. And Azure Data Studio, so that's this great cross-platform free tool for database professionals, really focused around writing queries, executing the queries, both for cloud-based databases and on-premises. Well, now we actually have this MongoDB extension. So now through the MongoDB shell, well now I can manage multiple accounts with a single view. I can perform create, um, read, update, delete operations, CRUD operations, configure settings, all via the Azure Data Studio. Azure Advisor now has MySQL flexible support. So Azure Advisor is that component in Azure that can look at many types of service, give me recommendations over performance, over cost, over security, over reliability. Well, now it's gonna do that for the MySQL flexible. Remember MySQL flexible is based around a VM instead of containerized technologies with the single server. Flexible lets me have Burstable VMs, I can stop start, I can get automatic failover, high availability. Well, now advisor is gonna give me recommendations. Hey, you should right size this to a different SKU. Hey, um, we should have these memory pressure, connection pooling, um, various product specific parameters, it's gonna give me guidance on. SQL Server 2016 to SQL um, Managed Instance Link is in preview. So that lets me have really any SQL Server 2016 instance hosted anywhere can connect to a SQL MI instance, giving me a hybrid solution. I get a near real-time replication. So I could then use that SQL MI maybe as a read-only replica. I maybe I do run my reporting against it. It could be used for failover in a disaster scenario. And I could even use it to migrate things from that SQL Server 2016, wherever it is, onto my SQL MI. Miscellaneous, Azure Key Vault provider for ARC enabled Kubernetes. Remember ARC is all about taking that Azure set of control plane and capabilities to other clouds and on-premises, uh, server enabled ARC, Kubernetes enabled ARC, any CNCF compatible Kubernetes can have this ARC enablement. And now one of the things once it's enabled for ARC is I can get an Azure Key Vault provider. That's gonna make it super easy now for the workloads running in the pods on that Kubernetes environment to be able to hook in and fetch secrets and keys and certificates 
from that Azure Key Vault. There is gonna be a service principle involved uh, as part of the configuration, but now all of those secrets are gonna be kept in the Key Vault, and it's a super simple way to interact with them from the pod. It just gets mounted um, just like any other part of the file system. Then the Azure AD temporary access pass has gone GA. This is the ability to create a one-time time-limited pass. I'm going to show this quick. For a user that counts as a strong authentication. So this can maybe be super useful for the initial onboarding to password list, for example. So if I go and look at one of my users, we'll look at Barry Allen, and I go to their authentication methods, I can add, and we see the example of a temporary access pass. So I can set a duration for this. I can say, hey, it's a one-time use. I can say add, and now it's generating me this value. I would give them this value. They would then go and now register with that. So it will count as the strong authentication. They can use it to onboard to password list. They could also use it to maybe reset their existing strong authentication methods. But it's just this one time use thing. We can see it's valid until then. So by the time you actually watch this video, it's not gonna work anymore. And it's just a great way to do that onboarding when I had those kind of password list environments. So that feature has now gone GA. And that's it. So that's all the updates uh, for this week. This was a Father's Day present, by the way. I did not buy this myself. Um, but until the next video, take care.